Today is week two of the Seeker's Regalia. And we mentioned what the Seeker was or who the Seeker was. The Seeker is who? Who's the Seeker? A Seeker of what? A Seeker of knowledge, yes. It's a Seeker of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? What kind of knowledge? Knowledge about Islam, knowledge about Allah. Yes, those are all correct. We said, we defined it as any knowledge that is beneficial, where? In the hereafter. Any knowledge that is beneficial in the hereafter. It, it could even be physical sciences. It could be chemistry. If it helps your iman, mashallah, go for it. <laughs> okay? That's not a problem. Um, any knowledge that is beneficial for the hereafter. Obviously, that includes knowledge of the Qur'an, knowledge of the Sunnah, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of the hereafter, etc. Okay? The regalia. What's the regalia? This is a quick review. Yeah. What you wear to represent what it is that you do. So if you are a seeker of knowledge, it should show to other people that you meet. So, now is it going to show in your clothing necessarily? Not necessarily. Although it should in a sense that the Muslim is going to dress modestly and whatnot. And there's actually a whole section dedicated to clothing that we will get to weeks, inshallah ta'ala, in a few weeks. Okay? But right now, the regalia, we're talking about the regalia in the sense that it's the ornament and the decoration, right? That shows in your character, it shows in your behavior, it shows in your manners. It shows who you are as a person. So, that's the regalia. So each one of these is a regalia. Each one of the ones we're going to talk about is a regalia. And we said the first regalia is sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making sure that knowledge is a what? We said knowledge is what? Not power. What did we say last week for the ones who were here? Knowledge is an act of worship. Knowledge is worship. And because it's worship, we need two things in order for it to be accepted. What are they? Sincerity and adherence to the sunnah. Which is love of Allah and His Messenger, right? So you have to have sincerity and you have to love Allah and His Messenger when doing it. Those are the two things that are required. And we talked about that at length. Today, we're talking about number two in the regalia. This is the regalia of role models. Okay? The regalia of having good role models when you do whatever it is that you do. I took this picture on a trip that I took out west. <laughs> so I just wanted to share it. <laughs> I thought it was nice. Because those were nice horses. Okay? So, uh, good role models. The regalia of following good role models. So this is called the regalia of the predecessors that we have. Okay? And these are defined as the first three generations of the Muslims. And we're going to talk about why. But before that, we're going to talk about who these people are first. So what's the first generation of Muslims? Who do we call, what do we call these people? The Sahaba. Which in, in English, those are the companions. So the Sahaba, the companions, good. That's generation number one. The following generation is who? The Tabi'een, which are, in English, the successors. And then the third generation is Atba'u Tabi'een, okay? Which is the successors of the successors. <laughs> the successors of the successors, okay? We're going to define each one. Who are the companions? What, what do you have to have in order to be a companion? You have to be a Muslim. Good, number one. You have to have seen the Prophet ﷺ. What if you were blind? Like Abdullah ibn Maktoum. Meet him. You have to meet him, which is a more correct term. Not just see him, but you have to meet him. Because obviously Abdullah ibn Maktoum, if it was just seeing, then he wouldn't be a Sahabi, but he is, right? <laughs> He's a blind man. He's actually the blind man in Surah Abasa. Right? Abasa wa tawalla an jahul a'ma al-a'ma here is, 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 is Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. So you have to meet the Prophet You have to be Muslim and you have to what? Last part, a die as a Muslim. Because there were a few individuals who converted, met the Prophet, but then they actually went back. 
And these are only like two or three people that we know of that did this. So those are not Sahaba in that sense. A Sahabi has to have met the Prophet ﷺ and, and lived as a Muslim and died as a Muslim as well. And they get a huge reward just for being that type of person, for being that dedicated individual who had the blessing of seeing the Prophet ﷺ and meeting him. Okay? It's a huge blessing, we can never reach it. That's why following these individuals is so high because they were following the Qur'an fresh. They were following the Sunnah fresh. It's uncorrupted. Nobody can say anything about it. They're getting it directly from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. They're seeing how the Prophet ﷺ did things and they're following him immediately. Which is why we should try to imitate these people as much as possible. That's why those people are good role models. But then they, the Sahaba, have their students, the following generation, the Tabi'een. The Tabi'een are the people who were Muslim, died as Muslims, but they did not or were not able to meet the Prophet ﷺ, but they were able to meet the companions. So anybody who met a companion is a Tabi'i, is a successor. This is why the successors are of levels. Imam al Dhahabi he puts like 20 tabaqat or something like this. Levels of, of, of Tabi'in. Because some of the successors met a lot of Sahaba, and obviously the later generations of successors met a few Sahaba. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah met one Sahabi his whole life. And he met him when he was a little boy. He met Anas. This is why many people consider Abu Hanifa to be a Tabi'i, because he met one companion. One. That's it. But there were many successors who also lived among the companions and were with them. Obviously, that's a Tabi'i, that's a successor who's at a higher level than somebody who only met one or two. Does this make sense? I hope, inshallah, that this is clear. So this is why there are many levels of Tabi'in. Yes? Are the children of Sahaba considered Tabi'in? Tabi'in, yes, they would be, yes. Because obviously his father is a Sahabi and so on and so forth. That's exactly right. Okay? The children of the Sahaba are considered Tabi'in, yes, without a doubt. If they obviously met their parents and they lived with them and whatnot. Then we have Atba'u Tabi'in, the, the successors of the successors. So these were people who were Muslim, they died as Muslims, and they met Tabi'in. And they are of multiple levels as well. Most of the scholars of the Ummah, the Imams that we follow, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Malik and whatnot, are technically of this third generation, and some are even of the fourth. Okay? Now, question, could there theoretically be a person who is in the successors of the successors who's better than a successor in the eyes of Allah? Yes. Yes. Could there be a successor who is maybe higher or, or, or uh, yani in, in reward and so forth, and this is crucial, but who is, yani has a higher degree in Jannah perhaps than a companion even? Not all the companions are the same. Not all the tabi'in are the same. Just because a person is in one of these generations doesn't necessarily guarantee righteousness. Okay? And this is actually crucial to understand. Just because a person is of the third generation doesn't mean that a person in the second generation is better. However, there's an exception to this. The companions, because of Allah's testimony, which we will show here in a second, the companions, that first generation, uh, are the best generation by far. To the extent that there was a question that was proposed um, about a person, his name is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Has anybody heard this name before? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Not Umar ibn Khattab, the companion. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. One, two, three, four, five, yeah, a few, six. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was a Khalifa. He was a leader of the Muslims about a hundred years after the death of the Prophet which technically puts him at the second generation, he might even be third. At Ba'at Tabi'in. Okay? Um, but he's right there in the middle. And he did amazing things. He ruled the Muslim Empire for a little short of three years, about two years and nine months. Two years and nine months he ruled. But during his rule, he established justice to such an extent that there, was, there were no more, there were no more poor people to give zakah in two years and nine months. Where before there was extravagance, there was now the Muslim empire is growing and all these things. But when he came, he established justice so much that people would struggle to find poor people to give their zakah to. They would go to somebody and the person would be like, I already have enough money. I don't need your zakah. 
Can you take my zakah? No, I can't take your zakah. Can you take my zakah? No. They would give it to the Muslim treasury. The Muslim treasury overflowed with money to such an extent that Umar told some of the people, go and use this money. We can't just leave it here sitting down. We have to spend it. And they would take that money and he said, even if you have to buy bread and feed the birds out in the mountains with it, go and do so. Just so that we don't say that we hoarded the zakah and we hoarded the sadaqat that the people are giving us. This is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, amazing person. Okay, knowledgeable, he was a scholar of hadith in his own right. Okay, he had a lot of things. He was the person in charge of expanding the Masjid al-Nabawi and he was actually in charge of the design for keeping the house of Aisha as is so that the grave is not inside the Masjid. He did a lot of things, right? So they asked a question later on to Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad and they said, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, is he better than so and so and so and so from the Sahaba? He started asking this question. And Imam Ahmad said, the dust that was in the nose of one of the Sahaba, the companions, while they're sitting with the Prophet, is better than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and everybody who's like him. <laughs> the dust in the nose of one of the companions, when they were in the presence of the Prophet, is better than people like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Why is he saying this? Because that's the Prophet and these are his companions and that's their status in Islam. And that's not an exaggeration, which is why we have to be very careful when we discuss the Sahaba. Because Allah is the one who's praising them, not us. And inshallah ta'ala we're going to get to this here in a second. Okay? How much praise there is for these people and why we should really take them as role models. And what this entails is that we learn their lives. We learn about who they were. There are plenty of books out there that talk about their life stories, that talk about who they were, their behavior, their akhlaq. Wallah, there's nothing more beneficial to the Muslim outside of studying the technical knowledge than studying these people's lives, looking at how they lived. Okay? And I want to make it clear here, and I want us to think about these following questions that I wrote down. Why are they the best of generations? Number one. And is this merely nostalgia? When we say this, yani, is it that we look back to those times and we're like, oh, I wish things were back like that? Is it just nostalgia or is there actually something concrete to what they actually did? And then another question is, does it mean that we have to go living back the same way that they were? I want us to think about these questions. We're not going to answer them now yet. Okay? Because we're trying to correct some misconceptions that people have about when we say we take these as role models, what does it actually mean? In what exactly? Does that mean that خلاص, we abandon our cars and get rid of technology and uh, we go back to living in mud houses and stuff? No, obviously. So what elements of their life should we take and what elements do we not need? That's the question that I want us to think about, right? Okay, so now, why these generations? Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this verse in the Qur'an, in Surah At-Tawbah. He says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي تَحْتَهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ This verse is in Surah At-Tawbah. Here's the translation. And the first forerunners among the muhajirin and the ansar. Allah here is praising the forerunners, the people who are early adopters. You know, right now there's a new iPhone coming out, the iPhone X or the iPhone 10. I don't know how you say it, the iPhone. Have you guys seen it? Has everybody seen what I'm talking about? There will be a group of people who are what they call in the industry early adopters. Early adopters are people who can't wait to get their hands on the latest and greatest piece of technology. They see it and are like, that's what I want, I'm gonna go and get it, I'm gonna do anything, everything that it takes for me to get it. And a person who is not only a late adopter, but a person who is just like, oh, I think I need to get one of those smartphones, I don't even know which one I'm gonna get, maybe I'm gonna get this one, wait, how much is this one? No, this one is cheaper, I'm just gonna get this. I have a question for you. Who are you gonna trust more when it comes to the piece of technology? If you have a phone problem, who are you going to go to? Are you going to go to the early adopter? Or are you going to go to the late adopter? Why are you going to go to the early adopter? Because they talk about everything about what Exactly. They know more about it. Are they, who do you think is going to be more passionate about it? The early adopter. Who do you think is going to be more enthusiastic when spreading it and talking about it? The early adopter. Do you guys understand this point? 
This is in technology. Now imagine in Islam. In Islam, there were early adopters. People who when they saw it, they're like, that's what I want. That's what I've been looking for my whole life. I'm going to go with this. I'm going to adopt it. I'm going to live by it. I'm going to become a Muslim, etc., etc. Okay? This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising the early adopters of Islam. This is why the people who accepted Islam first are always better than the people who accepted Islam late. Allah says, وَكُلَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى Everybody, Allah has guaranteed Jannah. Meaning from those Muslims who accepted and they were truthful and whatnot in the Sahaba, this is in Surah Al-Hadid. وَكُلَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى Everybody gets. But the people who were early adopters are always going to be a degree above. Because they race towards it, because they sacrifice so much, because this is what they wanted. Their sincerity. And this is why we should always look to those early adopters. And that's why we should also be early adopters. That's why there's a difference between a person who prays early in the time and a person who waits until, oh, there's about 15 minutes left to Asr, oh, I need to pray. Or the person who's like, five minutes till Asr, okay, I'm gonna go get wudu ready. You know, he's early. He's even before the time, he's ready. There's a huge difference between the two. And that's why we have to, we have to contemplate these realities, okay? Tayyib, Allah praises, number one, the first forerunners amongst the Muhajireen, number one, those are the people that He praises. Number two, the Ansar, the people who gave them support. If you support an early adopter, that's great. If you're helping them, you're supporting them, that's what the Ansar did. Allah is praising them. Then there's a third group. Who's this group? And those who followed them with good conduct. If you now sitting here in 2017, make a mental note and you put it in your mind, I want to follow those people, the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Okay? Then you will be included in this group. What does Allah say now about that group? Follow them with good contact. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. Imagine if Allah is pleased with you, is there anything else that you need? If Allah is happy with you, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who sends down rain wherever he wants, the one who blesses anybody with anything that he wants, the one who gives life and death, gives richness and, and poverty, the one who gives health and sickness. If Allah is pleased with you, khalas, what else do you want? That's why he mentions it first. Pleased with them, and they are pleased with him. And he has prepared for them gardens beneath rivers, beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever, and that is the great attainment. That's the great winning. Khalas, that's all you need. And he's merely saying it for the later generations for us. The only thing that you have to do is follow those groups of people. Bas. That's why this is the second regalia. The second adornment is to make sure that we follow those people. Tayyip, let's look at another, let's look at another verse. This verse is in Surah An-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Okay, here's the translation. And whoever opposes the messenger, so this is a threat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is threatening a person. Saying whoever opposes the messenger, if you oppose the messenger, which is obviously not a good thing, after guidance has become clear to him, so the opposition should only happen after guidance. This is the threat. So there are a lot of people who oppose the Prophet, but they were ignorant. That's why today, by the way, if there is a person who watches Fox News all day, and he's completely ignorant, he doesn't know guidance, he doesn't know what Islam actually truly represents, and he opposes Islam, in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually giving him an excuse. We don't completely blame that person because he's ignorant. So there is an excuse for ignorance, but his ignorance is not self-excused. Meaning he has a burden to remove ignorance from himself. Every human being does. So Allah might hold him accountable for why he was ignorant, but not for his opposition to Islam. And that's an amazing thing. So Allah is saying, if you oppose the Prophet after things were made clear to you, after you got guidance, and then what? And follows other than the way of the believers. This is a very interesting statement. Allah doesn't say and follow other than the way of Islam or other than the way of Iman or other than the way of the Qur'an or other than the way of the Sunnah. He says believers with an S. And He doesn't say prophets. Who are the believers here? 
Who, who is this group, the believers, when he says this in the Quran, in Surah At-Tawbah, in Surah An-Nisa? Yeah. Huh? The Sahaba, the companions, the people who adopted Islam early. These are the companions of the Prophet So Allah is testifying that the way of the companions is the way to follow. And if you follow other, if you follow other than the way of the companions, then you're, you're susceptible to this, to this threat. So you have to follow the companions. If you don't follow the companions, you're under a threat. What's the threat? We will give him what he has taken and drive him into the hellfire and evil, as its desti- and evil is its destination. Okay? We will give him what he has taken. Which means Allah will give him what he wants. Allah is fair. Allah's justice entails that he will give everybody what they want. If you want fame, you'll get fame. If you want riches, you'll get riches. In this life, then it won't help you in the hereafter. <laughs> Okay? Because they didn't want the hereafter. If they wanted the hereafter, Allah would give it to them. But because he didn't want paradise, why should he get it? If he never wanted it, why should he get it? Okay, So we asked this question, who are the believers referenced in this? We said they are the Sahaba. They are the companions. طيب, we have this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. This is an agreed upon hadith. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. It's narrated by Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال خير الناس قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم ثم يجيء أقوام تسبق شهادة أحدهم يمينه ويمينه شهادته We'll translate it. He says that the best of people are my generation. Who's saying this? Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. The best generation is who? The best of the people is my generation. The best of the people. The Master has a question. Did Prophet Isa have companions? Yes, he did. What are his companions known as? What are they known as? The disciples, yes, correct. The disciples. In Arabic, they're called Al-Hawariyun. Allah references them in the Quran. Prophet Isa has Hawariyun, disciples. And even in the Bible, they say that there were 13 disciples, right? The 12 disciples, one of them was Judas, and he betrayed, betrayed Jesus, etc. Okay? So we do know from both scriptures that Prophet Isa had disciples. Did Prophet Musa have some? Did he have companions? Yes, he did. What were they called? Does anybody know in Arabic? No, not Bani Israel. Bani Israel was the people that he was sent to. What were they called? Anybody know? It's a very particular word in Arabic. It's called an nuqaba Any of the chosen ones. Why are they nuqaba So when Prophet Musa went to the second time to talk to Allah, Remember the first time he talked to Allah was when he was come back from Madian. The second time he went to talk to Allah on the mountain of At-Tur, he took with him a group of Bani Israel, and these are called the Nuqaba. And there's differences of opinion on, on how many he took with him and whatnot, in order for them to receive the tablets and to take the Torah and all these things. But we know that those are the best of Bani Israel because Musa himself chose them and whatnot. I have a question for you. Out of, let's say, just these three prophets that we mentioned, Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Musa, Prophet Isa, who has the best companions? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, this should be clear. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad sallallahu companions are the best because of this hadith. Very clear. The best of people to ever live are my generation, the people that were with me, the people who supported me. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying. And when you read the seerah, when you read their lives, this will become evidently clear. You'll see that these people had the best hearts that they had the best intentions, that they helped and did everything in their power to help Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Even the Ansar, who were technically not early adopters, but they lived in Medina. When the Prophet Wasallam went to fight the battle of Badr, right, what did they say? Did they say, like Bani Israel said? Because Bani Israel, what did they say when Musa said, I'm going to go fight? They said, Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila, inna ha huna qa'idun. They said, go, you and your Lord, go and fight. We're going to sit right here. You go take care of that. The war, the fighting, we're not up for that task. You go and fight, you and Allah, and we're going to just wait here for you guys. That's basically what they said. It's in the Quran. But the Ansar, when the time for battle came, what did the Ansar say? They said, we will fight with you. We will fight in front of you. We will defend you from behind. We will defend you from the right. We will defend you from the left. We will be there everywhere. We will never let you down. That's the difference. Do you guys see that? That's the difference that's there. Okay? طيب. 
What was their regalia? Since we're talking about regalia, what was the companions and the successors and those following generations? What was their regalia? Their regalia was their belief. It's simplicity. The, one of the beautiful things about Islam is the simplicity of its belief. It's not complicated. Belief in Allah. And there's only one. Do we need any more explanation than this? God? It's very simple, right? Their belief was very simple. Their worship was very simple. They weren't complicated about it either. And it was beautiful. And the way that they worshipped, we know is the best because Allah praises it. Okay? They were best in following the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Us, we have a disadvantage because we didn't, we didn't live with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi We didn't see how he was. We didn't see how he prayed. So we're at a disadvantage automatically. And so therefore, we need to look and see how they followed in order for us to follow them as well, in following the Messenger Wasallam, We look at their manners, the way that they lived, their lives, okay? How good were they? How good were they with each other? And that's important. The companions with each other, did they get into arguments? Yes, they did. But did they solve their problems? Yes, they did. Did they get into disagreements? Yes, they did. Did they even go to war with each other at one point? Yes, they did. But even in the battlefield, they were still upright people. And they respected each other to the extent that Ali ibn Abi Talib, in one of the, after one, the, that big battle that happened, and the Muslims were taking some of the spoils of war, he said, why are you taking this? He said, we just fought a war. He says, no, these are Muslims. Give them back everything that's theirs. We can't take anything. The purpose of the fighting wasn't to get spoils of war, wasn't to kill, it was to stop a bigger fitna. And he ordered everybody to give back everything that was taken. So you look, even in the battlefield, they were upright individuals, which is why we should follow them in every way. Okay? They left arguing and debates. This point, by the way, is pointed out in the book, and that's why I have it here. It might seem out of place, but he tried to emphasize it. So Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid, he actually mentions this, and he says that they never argued and debated the same way that we do now even though they disagreed. The Sahaba, did they agree on everything? No, they did not. They were different individuals. They had different preferences. They had different ways that they excelled. They did different things differently, right? But did they ever argue and debate to the point where they would shun one another and never talk to the person? No. How many times do we do this now? Man, I, you know, it's like, SubhanAllah, two masajid, I know, stop talking to each other, because they got into a difference of opinion on whether zakat al-futr can be paid in money or does it have to be paid in food. Okay, do you guys hear my point? Did you that, that point? They had a difference of opinion and so they stopped dealing with one another merely based upon this issue. Whether we can pay zakat al-futr in money or food. Think about how petty that is sometimes. We can disagree, ya khi. We're still Muslim at the end of the day and we shouldn't let it divide us more. And the Sahaba never did. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, great Sahabi. He's the narrator of the previous hadith that we just mentioned. We'll mention a story about him. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, it was Hajj season, and Uthman ibn Affan was the Khalifa at the time. So this is after the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, after the time of Umar, Uthman is now the Khalifa. The Khalifa during those times would also double as the Amir of Hajj, which means he's the leader in charge of Hajj, he's the person who's going to give the khutbah. Um, on the day of Arafah, he's going to give khutbah to Eid, he's going to do all those things, okay? He's leading the way. So Uthman was leading the way. During Hajj, because of the amount, they had just recently conquered new countries. And literally hundreds of thousands of new Muslims are showing up to learn about Islam. And they came at the time of Hajj. And so Uthman said, instead of during Hajj, during Hajj when you're in Muzdalifah and Mina, what do you do? You combine and shorten your prayers. Sah? You combine, you do Jami'ah uh, 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 and Qasr when you're in Hajj. You combine and shorten your prayers. Uthman said, this year we are not going to combine or shorten our prayers. We're going to pray full prayers the entire Hajj. Why, Ya Uthman? This is because we have a lot of new Muslims coming in. And we want them to learn the religion and we don't want them to learn it wrong so that they go back and they say, hey, we saw them in Hajj combining and shortening, therefore we're going to combine and shorten as well. He wanted them to learn that every salah you have to pray it on time, it's four rak'ahs, it's whatever, it's whatever. Okay? Does this make sense? Is this clear? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was this close to leading a revolt against Uthman <laughs> at the time. Why? He said, Uthman, you've changed Hajj. 
Uthman, you're completely manipulating the way. This is not the way that the Prophet ﷺ did it. The Prophet combined and shortened. I don't care about these new Muslims. I don't care what it is that you think you're doing. We need to do Hajj the same way that the Prophet ﷺ did Hajj. We can't change it. And part of Hajj is that we combine and shorten. This is the Sunnah, this is how we've been doing it. You can't change it. Uthman, they had a back and forth. In the end, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud looked at himself and he says, he was tempted to say, you know what? Let Uthman do whatever he, wa he wants. We're going to start a new jama'ah. Guys, we're going to have a new jama'ah over here. And we're going to call ourselves jama'at following the sunnah or whatever it is, right? And we're going we're gonna to pray the way that the Prophet ﷺ prayed. We're going to combine and shorten. Yalla. Everybody is with me. Let's go. We're going to do hajj correctly. We're not going to follow Uthman. Did he do that though? No, he did not. He said, I'm going to follow Uthman. Even though I disagree with him, okay, I understand his point, and I'm going to follow Uthman, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to keep the Muslims united. Okay? I'm going to do the right thing, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pray with Uthman. And he did. And when he was asked about it, he said that dividing the Muslims is worse than establishing one little sunnah. Dividing the Muslims is worse than establishing one sunnah that's there. Because dividing the Muslims is haram. The unity of the Muslims is fard, is mandatory. And he said, I'm not going to do something sunnah over something that's mandatory. You can't. Mandatory always comes first. So that's what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said. Last point. What was their regalia? They understood who the enemy is. The true enemy. Unfortunately, many times as Muslims, we fall into the trap of thinking that this fellow Muslim, because he's different than me, he's my enemy. He might pray differently, speak differently, dress differently, look differently. And we start to treat each other as opponents, as enemies. This happens, by the way, not only amongst Yani Muslims in the masjid, it even happens in couples, right? A lot of times, they start to view each other as the enemy, the husband and the wife. And one of the first pieces of advice is that I give newlyweds or even people that have been married for a while, is you need to understand who your enemy is. Is your enemy your husband? Is your enemy your wife? And they look at me like, what? I'm like, that's how you've been behaving. <laughs> you've been treating your spouse as your, as your enemy. Who is your, your enemy? Both of you, who's your enemy? You have one enemy. Who is it? Shaitan. Yes, it is shaitan. So once you understand that shaitan is my enemy and we're actually on the same team, that actually changes your outlook and you no longer view that person as an opponent. And, we, and they understood this when dealing with each other. Even when Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah anhuma, they're both Sahaba, they were at war with each other. Okay, Guess what happened? When they were battling, a Roman general decides to gather his army, okay, and he decides to march upon the outskirts of the Muslim empire and try to take some cities away. You know what happened? Muawiyah sends him a letter. We still have the letter. Muawiyah sends him a letter and he says, take your armies back or I will put my hand in the hand of my brother and we will both come after you. <laughs> Meaning we're going to stop everything, okay? We're going to gather our forces and we're going to crush you. And you know that we can crush you. He's like, all this is, is brothers who are quarreling with one another and you have no business doing what you're doing. Take him back. And the guy got so scared from the letter that he did. And he did not attack. But do you see his mentality? He knew who the enemy was. And he wasn't afraid to do what's necessary to stop the enemy. That's why they're the best generation. That's why it's very hard for us to compete with them. We can try to emulate them, but we will never reach them. Okay? Also, regalia is not just fancy words. So a lot of what we said is fancy words in a way. <laughs> Okay? But regalia is not fancy words. So this is directly from the author, Bakr Abu Zaid. He said that a lot of times students of knowledge try to gain knowledge in order to be eloquent or to gain fancy words. And they might do what? Study philosophy and logic and all these like... Um, what he, he was calling them yani in Arabic, these fancy sciences. So did the Sahaba study philosophy or logic? They did not. Does that mean it's necessarily bad to study philosophy or logic? Kind of. Now I'm going to show you guys some quotes. And these are going to sound a little harsh, 
But I want you guys to have patience in this, just for a little bit, okay? Just for a little bit. And we're contrasting this to the Sahaba. So the Imam al-Dara he is a narrator of hadith, he has a book um, of hadith. It's actually considered one of the four authentic books of hadith outside of Bukhari and Muslim, al-Dara Qutni. Um, his book is one of them, okay? Um, he's not that well known because he's not in, considered in the six. This is because he came a little bit later, but he made sure that everything that he compiled was actually authentic. He says, there is nothing more despised to me than the study of philosophy. <laughs> now he says this as a scholar of hadith. And I just want you to read his quote. Now we're going to explain why they say this at the end. Okay, I'm just putting his quote. This is in the book of, by, this is in the Arabic book of Halit Talib al of the Regalia. There's nothing more despised to me than the study of philosophy. Ibn Taymiyyah is on the record saying, the most prone person to misguidance is a halfway philosopher. A halfway philosopher. Why? Because he who hasn't studied it is safe from its doubts, and he who has fully studied it realizes its futility, realizes that it's worthless. <laughs> I've had like uh, discussions with professors of philosophy. I ask him like, "What did you get out of it?" He's like, "Nothing." He's a professor. He teaches it, and he's like, "It really didn't really." I mean, once you reach the end of philosophy and you've studied it in depth, you realize. Aslan, these are things that people intuitively know, Aslan. We know it naturally. It's within our fitrah. We already know it, most of it. It's just that they're putting fancy words to what's going on in the fitrah. And he says the person who didn't study it at all, who doesn't study it, this type of person is safe from philosophy and is dangerous because he didn't even go that route. Because philosophy is the study of human intellect, thought, and doubt as well. And it puts a lot of doubts in people's minds. And this is why Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, the one who's in danger is the halfway philosopher. The person who thinks he knows, but he doesn't really know. The person who's read a little bit, but hasn't really read fully. You know, it's like I mentioned in my Quran class, like the guy who came to debate about the flat earth versus the round earth. Okay? That guy read a little bit, but he hasn't fully gone into it. And that's why he's completely confused. And that's the danger. And this is why Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, that the most prone to misguidance is the person who's a halfway philosopher. So don't be a halfway philosopher. Either go fully or kind of just stay away and study Islam and you'll be fine. Last is Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, who is the explainer of the book Hilal Talib al Ilm. He says that there is nothing more harmful to our beliefs as Muslims than those promoted by philosophers. He says in this modern day and age, and unfortunately, there are a lot of Muslims who get misguided once they start to read philosophy because they, don't, they haven't fully studied Islam and therefore they don't have that protection. This is why knowledge will protect you from those doubts. Okay? Because that's what philosophy tries to promote. Doubting everything. You start to question everything until you start to even question whether you exist yourself. You start to question whether Allah truly exists. You start to question whether this whole thing is real. You have the matrix mentality. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The Matrix mentality? Has anybody seen The Matrix, the movie? Okay, I'm not promoting you to watch The Matrix, right? I'm just saying, <laughs> as, as a movie, I had a guy, by the way, when I was in university, a guy who would walk around in those big leather trench coat, and he had the boots on, and he always walked around with sunglasses, okay? And he would walk around, and um, I never asked him, I was afraid to ask him, but one of the guys in our class actually bluntly asked him, he's like, hey man, why are you dressed like Neo? from the matrix and the man dead faced takes off his glasses and looks at him and is like because we are in the matrix <laughs> whoa that's a little <laughs> I was afraid the guy was going to be like okay you have a gun on you shoot me and I'll dodge the bullets or something you know I didn't want to <laughs> take it further than that but unfortunately you have people who might yeah and you get into that uh, situation right Okay, so why the attack on philosophy? We just mentioned some of the things. First off, philosophy as a science is limited in its scope to the mind, to the intellect. And it assumes that human intellect is the most advanced evaluator, negating the fact that Allah Himself, Azza wa Jal, knows more than all of humanity combined, and even more than that, right? It demotes the text below the intellect. What do we mean by the text? The Qur'an and the Sunnah, yes. 
That's why we say the text. It's not just the Quran. The Quran and the Sunnah demotes the text below the intellect. Which means that now we're using the intellect to evaluate everything and not the Quran and the Sunnah. This is a problem. If we say that it goes intellect and then Quran and Sunnah, this is a problem. It forces us to use our limited minds to formulate beliefs and conclusions about Allah and the unseen. So now, here's the problem. What happens when logic and text conflict? Because if we're using our limited minds to come to conclusions about Allah or about the unseen, can we fully do that? Can I evaluate things in the unseen using my logic? Is it logical that there are angels around us that are made out of light? Can I evaluate that with my intellect? It's very difficult. Okay? So I mentioned here two examples. We have Shajarat al-Zaqoom and we have the book of deeds around the neck. Okay? وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ and every person, we give him his ta'ir, his bird. His bird is actually his book because the book flaps when you're given your book. And your book is then put around your neck on the Day of Judgment. We'll mention this one first. The disbelievers came to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, well not Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, this verse doesn't make any sense. What are they doing? What's their first pitfall? They're trying to apply their limited intellect to a verse that's revealed by Allah. What did they say? They say, this verse doesn't make any sense and therefore we're rejecting it. We're using our intellect to evaluate. The thing is, the problem is, when you were 10 years old, how was your intellect? Versus when you were 20, versus when you're 30, versus when you're 40. And ask a 70 year old how his mind is compared to his 40 year old self, you'd say completely different. He would be like, when I was 40, I was a child. Compared to now when I'm 70 years old. So if the intellect is changing, how can we use something that's changing to evaluate something that does not change. That itself doesn't make any sense. But this is what they were trying to do. And unfortunately, we do have Muslims who are alive today who try to also still apply this logic. Meaning, if the verse doesn't logically make sense, or the hadith doesn't logically make sense, we reject it. And this is incorrect. We can't. Okay? So what did the disbelievers do? And then we're going to mention these two examples. They came to Prophet Muhammad and they said, Ya Rasulullah or Ya Muhammad, a book that contains every last detail of my life is hung around my neck? That doesn't make any sense. Because you said, This is whoever does an, a, a small, minuscule amount of good, he shall see it. It's written. So imagine the amount of detail that's in the book. Imagine how much detail there is in the book, right? So they said there is no way that a book like that could even be carried, let alone be in one book. It would be in multiple volumes. This doesn't make any sense. What did they do? They applied their limited intellect and logic to something that is unseen. That's in the hereafter. Allah can take care of it. Now that was 1400 years ago. If now I tell you on a little USB flash drive that you can hang on your keychain, you can have gigabytes and gigabytes worth of text and details. Can I hang this around my neck? Could this theoretically contain details about my life and even more? Yes, it could. Do you understand now the fault in using intellect and logic? Our intellect and logic is limited by our own human experiences and it's not going to be ever perfect. And therefore, if I try to say, well, in the hereafter, when Allah says that the deeds will be weighed, I don't, I, don't, I don't accept this. Because how are the deeds going to be weighed? Well, you're using your limited human experience to evaluate something that Allah has an aslan required you to evaluate. He just wants you to accept the idea that you're going to be held accountable. And that's what you have to realize. And that Allah Azza is recording everything. That's what you need to do. Don't try to think about it too much. And that's the danger of philosophy. Do you guys understand this point? Another point. The disbelievers came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, there's something that doesn't make sense in the Qur'an. Okay, go ahead. What is it? They said, your Qur'an says that there's a tree that's in the hellfire. Okay? That doesn't make any sense. If there's a tree in the fire, that tree is going to burn. 
right? Because trees are made out of wood, and that's the primary fuel for a fire. How can there be a tree that grows in the hellfire? What's the name of this tree, by the way? Shajarat al zaqum So it's mentioned multiple times in the Quran. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ta'am al athim It's the food for the people who sin, who disbelieve, right? It'll be a food for them. It's a horrid tree. It smells completely horrid. It's completely sour. It's, it provides no nourishment. It's also a form of punishment anyways. But they said, this doesn't logically make sense. Now as believers, what do we say? Yeah, Allah can do whatever He wants. If Allah wanted to create a tree that's in the hellfire that will not burn, he could, can He do that? Yes. <laughs> We're done. You know what I mean? We don't need to go beyond that. And so this led them to use like their intellect to reject that idea as well. And there's a danger. And obviously now for us as Muslims, we have people who might reject the ability to see Allah, which is false, or, they, or that Allah will weigh our deeds or weigh us, or all these types of things of the unseen. The thing is we cannot evaluate the unseen because we are limited in our minds, in our experiences, in our, in our intellects. And now if this is about elements of the unseen, then my question is the following. How about when it comes to Allah Himself? Can we ever evaluate Allah Himself using our human experience? We cannot. And therefore, if Allah says something about Himself, we trust Him, that that's truth. We can't reject it, right? We can't fully perhaps understand it, that's fine. He didn't you know, ask us to. But we understand his names and attributes and we have to study them. So when Allah says he is Ghafoor Rahim, I know what Al Ghafoor and what Al Rahim entails. When he says who was Samir al Basir, he is the seeing, he is the hearing, I know what that entails. And I know what it means on my part in terms of my actions and my deeds. And that's how the Sahaba excelled. They didn't get into these philosophical questions. Well, when Allah says that he hears, does he have ears? Yahi, Allah didn't ask you that question whether he has ears or not, or, or how does he hear? That's not, that's beyond your scope. You don't even know how you hear as a human. <laughs> you don't even know how your own ears work. And you're wondering about how Allah's ears work, you know, if He has them even. That's, you understand what I'm saying here. And that's why the Sahaba were the purest of people, in the sense that they didn't ask those complicated, big questions, because they didn't need to. They understood what it meant. When Allah says He hears everything, they're like, okay, that means that whatever I say, whatever I do, Allah's going to hear it. Okay, then I need to be diligent in my life. They understand the consequences. They understand the essence of what's being said. Okay, and they affirm it clearly without any complications. Yes. Yes. In order for that to be used on the day of judgment, to show you proof. Here's proof against you. Proof after proof after proof. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, philosophy is the study of knowledge in general, and especially knowledge of like reality, existence, God, theology, etc. Right? That's what we mean by philosophy. But it's completely from an intellectual point of view. So they just use logic. They say, well, um, uh, if you, you know, what, like that one philosopher where he says, if I think, therefore I am, right? But that's a conclusion based upon what? You know what I mean? That your self-existence, but does that mean that if another person isn't thinking that they do not exist? Or do they have a mind? I know that I have a mind, but I don't know if anybody else has a mind. I mean, I haven't tested it. So you have like some, some out, far out conclusions and it introduces a lot of doubts. So that's, you know what I mean? We won't need to go into philosophy too much. As far as the intellect though, that's a more important question. She said, we are encouraged in Islam to use our intellect, صح? And I keep on saying intellect, intellect as a bad thing. Intellect is a bad thing when put before the text. Intellect should come after or with the text. And some people actually argue that it should come hand in hand with the text. Some, 
and this is a more rigid opinion, say that it should come after the text. So the text, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and then my intellect. But I can't go the other way around. Because of the limitation of my intellect, it might lead me to reject clear verses from the Qur'an, clear ahadith, and so on and so forth. A person says, there's a hadith that says um, that alcohol is haram, for example. And intellectually, as long as I know that I can you know, not overindulge in alcohol, I think it's fine. I'm using my intellect here, right? Because the purpose of prohibiting alcohol is the harm that comes from it. So as long as I drink, right, to my limit, and I'm not over drinking, and there's no harm that's coming from my drinking, it should be fine. What am I doing there? I'm putting my intellect above what the Qur'an and the Sunnah says. Do you see what happens there? So they either need to go hand in hand, or one comes before the other. So that's where the text comes before the intellect. But Ibn Taymiyyah is actually of the opinion that they do always come in hand in hand. But in order for us to be safe, a lot of times we will say Qur'an and Sunnah first, and then the intellect second. And this is why he wrote a huge book, 15 volumes. In fact, Sheikh Yasser's PhD dissertation was on this topic, which is Dab Ta'aruf al aqli wa Naql. It is the, the, how do we translate this? It is that there's no contradiction between pure intellect and authentic text. Pure intellect means intellect that hasn't been corrupted. Our thoughts haven't been corrupted. You know, we have logic, sound thought. It will always go hand in hand with the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is true, and he proved it. He has like 45 points over 15 volumes, and he expands on all of them, proving this point using so many different examples in so many different ways. And he was trying to prove a point to a lot of those philosophers who were Muslims, who were trying to say, no, intellect is always superior. And he was trying to prove them, no, these actually go hand in hand. You're thinking that it's superior because they contradict. But he was trying to prove that they should never contradict. Okay? Last question, who and when should philosophy be studied? So who should study philosophy? When should philosophy be studied? This is my answer from talking to many people about this issue, that it should be studied in order to understand where a lot of non-Muslims are coming from. Now, know this, not every non-Muslim is a philosopher, obviously. Many atheists have studied a little bit of philosophy, but they haven't gone into it in depth. And there are Muslims who, mashallah, they did study philosophy, and not only did they use the same philosophy to disprove the philosophy, and yani they studied it to disprove it, <laughs> but to also disprove yani, what the atheists claim. So there's a book, like I have the book actually with me, it's called uh, The Divine Reality by Hamza Zorsis, okay, the Greek convert, he's the head of Ayera, which I recently joined um, as one of their US-based instructors. He has, he, he's getting soon, in a few months, his PhD in philosophy. And he has a lot of these debates on YouTube. You can look at them. These are from years ago, four or five years ago, some of them. More recently, he stopped doing a lot of the debates. And this is not because he hasn't sought them out. And he does the debates. He doesn't believe in debates, by the way. He does them to prove to the Muslims that they actually can debate. That they actually can stand up to a lot of these atheists who claim to be of high rationality, of high reasoning, that we're intellectuals and you Muslims don't know anything about anything, and therefore you can't even stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with us. He did those debates to prove to a lot of the Muslims that actually we can debate them and win. His last debate he did last uh, a few months ago, in the spring, with the head, this is not published by the way because they didn't want to publish it, because they were so embarrassed. <laughs> okay, He did it with the head of the um, Atheist Society of Ireland. The Atheist Society of Ireland, صح? And, um, oh, I went too, f sorry, I went back. Um, he debated the guy, the head of the Atheist Society of Ireland. Halfway through the debate, it stopped to be a debate, and it became a lecture, where the guy, because he has his PhD in philosophy, another guy is just an atheist, who like studied biology or something, has no idea what he's talking about in philosophy, he actually started to correct him. He's like, actually, what you're talking about is this. In philosophy, it's this. And he started to correct him, and the guy's like, oh yeah, that's right. And he's correcting his own belief. So he knows the other guy's aqidah better than the guy who's adopting the aqidah knows it. Okay? And 
He's like, basically I'm teaching these guys what they believe in. After a while. And this is why they stop debating. Once you understand where they're coming from. So if you study philosophy from that perspective, that's great. But, and he said this himself, you always have to have a deeply rooted, sound, Islamic foundation before you do so. Because it promotes a lot of doubts, it promotes a lot of things, and if you don't know what your own belief is, it'll cause you some problems. Okay? That's where he's coming from. And so his book, I recommend, it's on Amazon, you can order it, it's called The Divine Reality. I have my own yani, copy, I have a, a bazillion notes yani, throughout the whole thing. Really good read. He's actually coming out, if you want to wait a few months, he's coming out with the second edition. And basically for half the book, he actually goes into some deep philosophical questions, but he actually answers them using the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And he actually has his references there. So he's not using philosophy to debate philosophy. He knows his philosophy, he knows what they say, and then he shows how actually the Qur'an and the Sunnah have something superior always. That's why the best asan way to debate with atheists and people who claim to have like some sort of intellect and whatnot is the Qur'an itself, but you have to have a knowledge of the Qur'an in order to do so. Very good. What time is it now? 2.41. How long have we been going for? <laughs> yeah, we've, go, we've been going for about an hour. Um, so section number three was going to be the regalia of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? The regalia of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will stop here. Um, and we won't, uh, we won't go beyond this because I think this, the, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes hand in hand with the section after it which is muraqabatullah azza wa being watchful of Allah. And these are regalias that are much needed and we'll talk about them inshallah ta'ala next week. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up? Any questions inshallah ta'ala? Issues? Yes. Is there anything that says you have to cover your head when you use the restroom? No. There isn't. Not that I know of. Even when I remember there was one sheikh who was asked this question, he said if the person is used to wearing something on their head, aslan, there's no problem to continue doing so in the restroom. Does that make sense? If it's already their habit and whatnot, then that's completely fine. In front of? No. You don't have to. If they're maharim, you know. If of your family members, yeah. Yes, that's not our, you don't have to, no. No, no, no. I don't, not that I know of, to be honest, no. If, uh, and it depends on what type of mahram. So there's a mahram from like uh, marriage, and there's a mahram through like nasab. There's different levels. Yeah, your kids and your husband and your fathers and your cousins, know, not your cousins, but your, your brothers and your uncles. No, you don't need to wear in front of them at all. No. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay. Very good. Yes. Um, okay, so can you study like Christianity and Judaism if you have a good standing ground in, in Islam? Yes be able to debate or to be able to, di to dispel some of their misconceptions, of course. Okay? But you have to have that solid ground in Islam first. I would never recommend it for somebody who doesn't have a solid foundation in Islam. You have to have a solid foundation in Islam. Now. Okay? Yes? That's okay. You don't have to wear a hijab in front of him. Yeah. Inshallah. Okay. If that's it. بارك الله فيكم جزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك. If anybody hasn't signed up, I haven't sent out any emails, so that's why I got your emails last week for the people who don't. I don't have their emails, but if I don't have your email, you can send it to us info at masjid-rahman.org, which is found on our website. Just go to our website, send us an email, be like, hey, add me to the Seekers Regalia email list, and that way you can get the PDF of the slides, and you can get the audio of the lectures, um, and you can get the PDF of the book that we're going off of as well. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.